I think I'm having an art attack. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Art Attack with your host, the extraordinary, talented, incredibly knowledgeable art historian, Lizzie Dastin, and myself, Bua. Today, we are talking about one of the greatest painters, artists uh, that has ever, ever been in the game, and that is Edgar Degas. And a lot of people pronounce his name, and you don't have to be white trash or from the deep, dirty South to say Degas or Degas. I've heard it all. Have you really? Yeah. It's like people talking about Cezanne. They're like, have you, do you know an artist named Kazan? And I'm like, Kazan, Degas, Kazan, <laughs> Monet, Manet. Isn't a basketball Manet. movie? <laughs> but that's Shazam with Shaq. But Close. Um, it's amazing how many people can't pronounce Edgar Degas. Well, it's actually Degas. Degas. Because... And en français, I'd always say right. Degas. Mais en anglais, de- Degas, perhaps, right? Well, initially, his when he was born, his name was D E space G A S, which mm. means from Ga. So Ga is a region in France, and so that mm. was how surnames worked. It's uh, Edgar from Ga, but that then he thought that that sounded too aristocratic, and so mm. he shortened it to Dega. Now, speaking of aristocratic, a lot of people think that because of uh, his work, Dega was from. The aristocracy. In fact, one of my best friends the other day, who's a very knowledgeable art historian and artist, was like, oh, yeah, he was an aristocrat. He actually wasn't. Degas was from the upper middle class. Uh, So he he was definitely not broke, but he was from some kind of wealth because his mother was from America. She was from New Orleans, and she owned a cotton plantation. Dun-dun-dun. Truth be told... And his dad, I believe, was from Paris. And they all grew up, obviously, he grew up in France. And, uh, but he did grow up with a sense of security and enough wealth to allow him to do what he did. Right. And we have already talked about Degas a little bit in our episode on Impressionism. So I won't belabor the history too much since that would be a little redundant. But I think that we need to give some kind of foundation historically. Sure. So he was a painter in France at a time when academic painting was the establishment. So work that was incredibly precise in its execution and mythological or religious or historical in its narrative. And that was the kind of art that was just churning out of the the academy, which was the establishment. And Degas and his colleagues, Monet, Renoir, Berth Morisot, Mary Cassatt, they thought, let's do something really disruptive. Let's paint life as it actually is and not the way that we imagine it having been in the past. And so they are painting the contemporary moment and they're doing it with a loosened wrist. And so their brushwork is dappled. They we can actually see the artist's personality in their hand, in their touch. And they are painting en plein air, which was outdoors, as opposed to in a controlled studio. And all of that was really a way to buck the system in the mainstream. And initially, the Academy rejected them. And so they decided, well, we are just going to show our work outside the Academy. And they called it the Salon de Refusé, so the, lawn of the, the Salon of the Refused. And then that became the most popular, most informative, and also most authentic art form of the time. And Degas specifically was really influenced by photography, and we see that in his aesthetic choices. So typically, art, the subject is front and center. And that is a a stable, traditional choice. And Degas thought, well, what would happen if I moved my subjects off kilter? And so there are these diagonally sweeping lines in many of his paintings. And that comes from the freeing of the photographic gaze. But it also comes from Japanese prints, these ukiyo-e woodblock prints. 
that a lot of the Impressionists were influenced by, but Degas seems to have taken that aesthetic to a heightened level. So you went really far into his career. Let's back up a little bit. <laughs> I said some context. Of, but one of, some of what you said is actually not true. Uh, what is not true is that um, of the Impressionists, uh, Degas was the academic. Uh, Degas was the Ecole de Beaux-Arts academic prodigy of Jean-Dominique Gang, who was a neoclassicist, and of course his teacher was Jacques-Louis David. Degas was a product of that lineage, uh, and he also studied with a lot of other academics. So early in Degas' career, if we can just kind of go back a little bit, everything you said was right, but I just wanted to like adjust a couple of things just because my obsession with Degas is, is insane. So Degas was uh, Degas was a was a real true academic and a real true prodigy, and I think um, he initially was one of those guys who was going to the museums. He was he was copying uh, Rembrandt, he was copying Velasquez, he was doing a lot of master copies, a lot of academic stuff, a lot of drawing from uh, Greek s- sculpture, a lot of antiquity drawing, which is what all of the you know the children of the master students do, right? It's, it's the it's the typical education. But, and then, and then early on, he was a historical painter. So he did a lot of historical scenes. And that's what he was showing at the academic shows. And, and no one really paid attention to him because it wasn't really, he wasn't really doing anything different. So the difference was here, and here's where I'll, I'll make the adjustment, is that he wasn't a plein air painter. Mm-hmm. Degas composed in his studio. And you're right, the Impressionists were plain air. That was part of their shtick, right, is that they're capturing the light. They're capturing the impression of the landscape. But Degas was really, in a way, he wasn't an Impressionist, even though he hated being an Impressionist. He didn't, de- he didn't define himself as an Impressionist. He didn't go along with uh, any of that. He hated the idea of even being categorized as that because he was probably, he thought he was probably much more you know, but he didn't want to be part of this old stuff he placed. But I think it came down to popularity. When he became an impressionist, he was popular. But he wasn't like a Monet who was painting the lilies, or a Manet who was painting Luncheon sur le déjeuner, or out there. He was really taking those images, much like the classical, like like Ang, who said, "You need to draw from your mind," and therefore he was able to take the sketches, the photography, whatever it was, and to build the paintings in his studio. He assembled the work in his studio, uh, which did separate him artistically and philosophically from the Impressionists. But that being said, you know, obviously we've grouped him as an Impressionist because he became very popular. He was the Impressionist of the Impressionists, with, I would say, the exception of Manet, who was the best draftsman. He had a very different kind of upbringing than the other uh, impressionist, because not saying that Berthe Morisot was a very good draftsman, but Degas was another level. He was, and I'm really glad you clarified that. And it's interesting because in that regard, the fact that Degas actually did paint in a studio, and more than that, he painted interior spaces, as opposed to the luncheon he's painting inside dancer studios. And he did paint racehorses, and so that would have been outdoors, but he painted But he composed theaters. them indoors. Right, right. Yeah, and yeah. so in that respect, he is the most academic of the painters, but I think in his adoption of photography or absorption of those aesthetics, he's the most innovative. Mm-hmm. And so there's a little bit of tension between wanting to push forward and explore something new and then being tethered nevertheless to the past. And you're right, he didn't identify as an impressionist. He called himself a realist, Mm -hmm. which I think people don't really talk about because there is a realist movement in Paris that was spearheaded by Courbet, and that aesthetic is wildly different from the impressionist. But what Degas meant by that term is that he's painting authentically with sincerity. And so it isn't realism with a capital R, but it is realism with a lowercase. Lowercase. Got it. Yeah, lowercase realist. <laughs> so, so Degas, uh, when, he, when he got into the scene, it was uh, because he was at the Louvre, as he usually was, and he was doing, I think, an etching of a, a Rembrandt, I believe, and Manet came up to him, a stranger at the time, 
and was like, oh, that's pretty good, but you should do this, 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 this. And he was like, yo, who the hell is this dude telling me? And he was like, damn, he's right. <laughs> and no, and then, and that became a lifelong friendship with Manet. Uh, he had a lot of respect for Manet um, in the movement, but I think that's what brought him into the movement. He did not have a lot of respect for Monet. In fact, he said that uh, basically Monet was better as a, as, a, as a mouthpiece than he was as an artist, that his paintings were, no, were beautiful decorations, uh, you know, basically equating it to wallpaper, and really didn't value him at all. On the other hand, he had a tremendous amount of respect for Pissarro, who was the Jew of the movement, and he was the academic and the mind of Impressionism. And the irony there is that Edgar Degas was a very disturbing anti-Semite. He did not like Jews. He was outspoken about it. And uh, and yet, here he is with Passaro. He's like, yeah, I don't like Jews, but I, I have some friends who are Jewish. You know, one of those is just like, he was a bigot. He was a sexist, but he respected Berth Morisot. He was an anti-Semite, but he respected Passaro. So there's all these contradictions of personality. And he was a curmudgeon introvert who really didn't have a lot of nice things to say about a lot of people. Right. And I'm so glad that you brought up the Pizarro situation. And if I may add one more thing that you're going to love before you go okay, into it, because so you're excited. about to launch... I believe Pissarro was to Impressionism in terms of him being the intellect, academic, philosoph you know, philosophic Jew as Motherwell was to the Expressionists. The abstract Expressionists? Yeah, absolutely. What? You because made a he was, contemporary because he was, reference. Because he was the intellectual, you know, academic Jew. And I feel like, you know, it, it's funny how, you know, intellectually just activated that these figureheads are. I don't think Pizarro was the greatest impressionist. But when I read Pizarro, I'm like, yo, he's just, he's, he's, he's brilliant. He's beautiful. You know what I mean? Like he's saying some amazing things. He is. And initially, as you mentioned, Degas was very supportive of Pizarro and talked about the mastery of Pizarro's craft in the press. And then in 1894, there was a pivotal moment in French history, and it's called the, uh, the Dreyfus Affair. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge schism or produced a huge schism of anti-Semitism. And we have talked about Degas' anti-Semitism before, and I think that I may have said that he was a Nazi supporter, which is not correct, because at this point in history... There were no Nazis. There were no Nazis. Well, there were maybe proto-Nazis, sure. but the actual Nazis is the self-identified people who... The, ba the beta Nazis. Right, yeah. who followed Hitler, not yet in definition. So anyway, Dreyfus was a member of the French militia, and he was falsely accused of giving governmental secrets to the Germans. Right. And there was just such hideous public treatment of Dreyfus. He was paraded around the streets and the crowd screamed, kill the Judas, kill the Jew. And it was a really divisive moment mm -hmm. that illuminated the anti-Semitism in Europe, but specifically in, in France. And Degas was a big anti-Semite, or at least this situation, it brought it to the fore, and it divided the Impressionists, too. And he and Renoir, they were anti-Dreyfus, and then Pizarro and Manet were very pro-Dreyfus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when Degas was interviewed about his art or when he was discussing it in some forum and Pizarro came up, he was really negative about Pizarro. And then this interviewer said, but previously you were very supportive. And his response was, well, that was before Dreyfus. Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that Rem that Renoir was an anti-Semite because I always hated his work Me anyway. Me too. He's right. the worst of the Impressionists. He's the worst. <laughs> He's so he's oh god Renoir and he's an anti semite done just get <laughs> dead every, to me okay attention Louvre Musée d'Orsay just take his work down throw it in the garbage uh it's gross anyway it's so weird right because Degas is so good you're like god I, god I wish he wasn't an anti semite it's or just, a misogynist yeah I mean it's it's disturbing when you hear of these people who you love so much and who have added so much 
important to the canon of art history, and then you hear their personal stories, that's that's a whole other podcast, right? That's like a Woody Allen, Michael Jackson type podcast that we will have about art. But it does mess with your head, and you and and it's and it's really hard to talk about that. And especially when Degas, who superficially is an anti-Semite, but yet has these relationships with Passaro and admiration, and same with, and he is superficially a misogynist, but then says such amazing things about Berthe Morisot, you know, so like, where's his head at? But you know where his head is at with painting. This is a guy who had a very uh, regimented schedule. He worked every single day, took his supper during work, and then after supper, went out into the streets of Paris. And that's when Degas did, uh, explored the world, you know, the Moulin Rouge. Uh, He explored, obviously, the operas. Uh, Degas was one of the greatest narrative painters of the opera houses. Uh, Perhaps he did some stuff of the brothels, like Lautrec, and he was also a friend of Toulouse Lautrec. Uh, and when when Degas uh, lived a decently long life, a lot of his friends started to just disappear. Lautrec died of alcoholism. Uh, Manet passed. Uh, everybody seemed to be to be going, uh, and he didn't have a family. It was a really other weird thing. He had basically just a maid who took care of him and served him. But he didn't really have a family. But the one thing that he did have, which he was almost obsessed with, much like Rembrandt, ironically, is that Degas had one of the greatest art collections (laughs) of all time. Degas collected Eugene Delacroix, which is interesting because his teacher, Ang, and Delacroix were on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of their philosophies of art. Delacroix being all about tone, tone, color, color, and Degas always being about line, line, right? Line, tone. So Degas loved Delacroix, contrary to what his teachers thought about him. He loved Velasquez. He had Velasquez's. He had old masters. I mean, he had an extensive art collection. He was, in his, in his own words, he was addicted to collecting. So... I always find that fascinating when you get artists like Rembrandt, who was also addicted to collecting. A lot of why Rembrandt went bankrupt uh, was because of his addiction to collecting art, you know, and same with Degas. Right. And he also had an extensive collection of these ukiyo-e woodblock prints. And so that shows that he isn't just interested in the past, but he's interested in other parts of the world. And so I love that his perspective as a collector and as a visual thinker is not so myopically faced toward Europe, that he's looking to Japan. And he was really influenced by the kind of art that came out and this flatness that was pursued aesthetically and also the diagonal nature of how the content is contained. And we see that in his art. And I was really fascinated when you mentioned that he himself was very isolated and that he didn't have a family because I see that loneliness and that isolation in much of his work. And I'm thinking of the absinthe drinker, which is a couple Mm -hmm. together in a cafe. But to me, there is nothing more tragic than finding loneliness in a group. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we can all relate to that experience where you're surrounded by people, but you're not connecting. And we see that in this painting The woman and the man are not speaking. She is just in this delirious fog of the absinthe, of whatever, of her inner space, of her psychology, whatever it may be. But the colors are muted, which is atypical of Impressionism. The scene feels very crowded, and she just feels really lonely. And perhaps that's why Degas was attracted to themes like that, because of his own isolation from society. Yeah, and as Degas uh, grew older and lonelier, his inner circle started to die and disappear. He became more introverted. Uh, He started to kind of not really go out as much, but a lot of that also had to do with the fact that he was going blind. Degas uh, early on had vision problems, and a lot of 
some art history experts will say that his color palette, which became very vibrant and different as he got older, especially working in pastels, was because he was blind. And so he was using colors more experimentally because he didn't really know what the hell he was picking up. And the way that he did, to me, some of the greatest of his works are his later works, where he really became an official impressionist, right? A lot of the bathers. When you look at Degas' bathers, uh, whether they're the monoprints, which are gorgeous, or they're the pastels, they were just like, they were unbelievable because he was able to get this kind of feminine, like you say, it felt like a Japanese woodblock, but it was pastel-y. Um, the femininity, but the gestural movement with this kind of draftsmanship and this really beautiful colors, it's it's a it's works that you can't even explain how powerful they are. And yet it's just a single figure bathing, right? It's right. weird. Well, like, and gonna, you're looking down on them, you know? I was just going to say, to me, and there's this one pastel of a bather in particular that mm -hmm. I'm thinking about. It's called At the Tub. And At the Tub. That's the one I was thinking in my head. At the Tub. Right. And I would like to try to unravel the power of that particular image, which on its surface is a really everyday mundane activity. We have a woman bathing in a tiny tub, but as you mentioned, the perspective is so drastic, we are looking down at her at such a sharp angle that her nudity, which is functional, not sexual, suddenly becomes warped in this voyeuristic space. And to me, and of course, this could just be the lens through which I'm looking at this work, but it seems like his misogyny shows up a little bit in this particular pastel because the power of the viewer is far more substantial than the power of the bather. We have her body crouched in vulnerability and in a lack of awareness of us as a viewer looking down on her. And so I just, I think that dialectic of power is is pretty profound in that particular work. Yeah, see, I disagree respectfully with you, and I see it as I could understand the objectification of the female figure, but uh, I also see it as a as a deep exploration into uh, not exploiting the female nude by you know or glorifying the female nude uh, rather because he is seeing her. Uh, as as a shape, he is seeing her as a form, and he is seeing her through the lens of, in my opinion, at this point, not necessarily of a misogynist, but of an artist. An artist looks for shape first, value second, color third, and that's what I think Degas doing. He's seeing this as like she's just part of the landscape, and in a way, it becomes a figurative landscape painting where she is shape first, value second, color third. And I'd like to talk about, just to derail for a second, about how he used pastels, because from my understanding, and pastels is freaking gorgeous. Like, if you can really paint with pastels, you can get some great colors. I think that Degas has to be, on a technical level, considered probably the greatest pastel artist I've ever known. And he would melt them down, and he would paint with them, uh, very thinly. And, and, and when Degas was painting in oils, he, he painted very thin, uh, which was he would take you know, turpentine and make sure a lot of oil painters, like Van Gogh's the opposite end of the spectrum, right? He painted very like thick and uh, impasto. But Degas thins everything down, whether it's with a medium or with turpentine, uh, now with terpenoid. You can't, can't, no one's using turpentine anymore. But he would thin it down, and much like he would do with the pastels, he would thin it down, he would paint it with a brush, and then he would draw over that with pastels. And he would kind of get a, you know, he would get a layer that would dry, and then he would be able to paint on top of it with chalk, with pastels. So his technique, which he probably cultivated after time of experimental, you know, use, he figured out a way that worked for him, and he was able to master it. And we see it the most in his ballet stuff. Uh, his ballet work is just really beautiful. He was able to go behind the scenes of the ballet. They let him backstage 
and he was able to draw and compose and take it back to his studio, plan it out, and compose it. Some of those compositions are so beautiful. I mean, we could have a whole show on just his ballet uh, work, but some of that work is just so freaking beautiful. It's like hard to look at. And his sculptures, which now we look at, you know, we go to the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, you could see Degas' bronzes, which are gorgeous. But apparently, back then, they were scandalous because he actually took the gear, the actual paraphernalia from the dancers. Did you know that? I did. And when we say they, I think the more accurate term would be the sculpture that he released during the time of his life, which was the little ballerina age 14. That was scandalous. And that, that was, but it wasn't because of the clothes? No, it okay. was because of the awkwardness of the way that he sculpted her. That, um. that people just expect, I guess, the bodies of ballerinas to be delicate and lithe and in movement. Mm -hmm. And there was something truthful, but a little bit transitional about the way that Degas rendered this little girl, that we mm -hmm. see the awkwardness of a transitional time. Mm -hmm. And he did put real objects in with the bronze. And so her hair is tied by an actual piece of cloth, for right. instance. And it was really sad for Degas because he was so excited to transition into sculpture. <laughs> and the way that this work was received was so negative that he said, I'm never working in sculpture again, that's it. But then, as you mentioned, that he's starting to go blind, out of necessity, he worked again with wax mm. in order to, he can't see the human form at this point, really, and so he's sculpting it in order to understand it. So we have tons of wax sculptures mm -hmm. of women, specifically nudes, with these awkward leg positionings, and they are raw, and you can see sometimes the artist's thumbprint in the wax. So he, right before he died, said to his family, I never want these to see the light of day, because he was so upset about the reception of this mm -hmm. one bronze that he released publicly. And his son was really opportunistic, and so after Degas's death, he had the wax sculptures cast in bronze, and so it's a process called the lost wax technique. And so mm -hmm. it, it destroys the original, but it creates a mold from which multiples can be produced. And even though his father would have really been furious and so embarrassed, the son wanted to make money off of him. And so that's why we see tons of Degas sculptures. But the only one that Degas sanctioned was the ballerina age 14. That's amazing. And, you know, wrapping it up, because uh, we can go on ad nauseum about Degas, but you know he he was able to take the simple things in life, the 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 dancing, the ironing, you know, the bathing, and make it a story, you know, and it was stuff that goes on behind closed doors that you would never really think warrants or deserves to be painted, right? So that artist today, like, there's a really wonderful artist named Skip Lepke, Malcolm Lepke. He does the same thing, you know, a la Degas. A lot of people do. But it was Degas who was really saying, look how beautiful this is. Look how charming this is. You know, whether you look at it through the lens of misogyny or I look at it through the lens of uh, exploration and shape, we can see that he's taking, he's taking a world and a time and a place, and he's made it very beautiful for all of us to enjoy. It was the kind of art that, as a kid in New York, everybody had a Degas in their bathroom, you know what I mean? Because it's like soothing, it's peaceful. The colors are really like something grounding about his work. Yes, and actually that just reminds me quickly of an anecdote, which is going to be the most privileged, bougie thing that I will ever say on the show, but it actually is relevant, and so I think that it is worth mentioning. So just a little bit of backstory. As I think we've talked about, my grandfather was a very successful writer, and he also had a really extensive art collection, including tons of prints and drawings and paintings, and he loved the Impressionists. And before he moved houses at the end of his life, he said to me, and I was taking art history at the time, he said, you can pick out any two works that you want mm. in this one hall of drawings and prints. And I thought, amazing, because I know what's valuable. So I picked a Mary Cassatt print and a Degas drawing. So I've been holding what? on to this drawing for ages. It's of a ballerina, really beautiful. So then I think, I'm going to sell this shit, and I'm going to be funded for the rest of my life. So I go to an auction house with a drawing, and they said, mm, we think it's fake. 
and they explained why. And it's you mentioned at the beginning of the episode that Dugas was an incredible draftsman. Mm -hmm. And it's true. His lines are continuous. And I wasn't looking critically at this drawing that I had, and it was very staccato mm. with the movements. There are all these little cross hatches. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to bring this to an authenticator because it's so embarrassing that I didn't know and that I guess my grandfather didn't know either. And so this gets into a whole episode of fakes and forgeries. But the reason I'm sharing this is because I asked them, well, how, what is the process of authentication like? And they said there are Degas connoisseurs in Paris. Okay. They only work a couple weeks out of the year and you have to go to Paris <laughs> and bring in the work. And if they deem that it's a fake, they destroy it on the spot. Wow. I know. So I, I didn't... would just go there with like, <laughs> you know, strapped and be like, you can not touch that because you're going to get <laughs> fucked up. I'm from New York. You know what I mean? That would not happen. But uh, that's crazy. But you should do it anyway. No, because I'll it's go, a reminder I'll, I'll to of my Paris. grandfather. No, I don't want it to get destroyed because it's totally a fake. But it's worth le- it is a fake, right? <laughs> I think so. Just give it I'll to me. I'll show it to you Let and me, you'll g- tell me. Yeah, give it to me. I'll tell you if it's a fake or not. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay, guys, thank you for this amazing episode on Edgar Degas. If you don't know him, uh, definitely check out the YouTube because that's where we're going to have all the visuals. And you will know him because he's an absolute master. And you want to say anything else? Oh, and by the way, like just, you know, we do this for the love. um, And we just all we want you guys to do is to write a review on iTunes. uh, Hopefully not scathing. Five stars. Don't not do it. That would be fantastic. And Tommy John. Yeah, thank you to our sponsor. And he the uh, the company is so great. They're seamless underwear for men and for women. And if you're interested in checking it out, if you enter the promo code Art Attack. At checkout, you'll get 20% off of your first order. So get it so that you could just hold it in place. Peace.